Let's start. So hello, everyone around the world. Welcome to another episode of the IEEE Power and Energy Society student podcast. This is our monthly conversation with guests that inspire us, speak from experience, and drive innovation. I'm your host, Clinton Cadet. I'm a fourth year electrical engineering student at BCIT in Vancouver, Canada. The team behind this podcast consists of our producer, Priya Mana, our graphic designer and social media coordinator, Shani Lin, our marketing and publicity leader, Augusto Zanin, and our editors, Adamir and Paul Nieto. And I can't forget our mentors and executive producers, Hasala Dharmawardena and Conrad Smith. So as always, this podcast is made for you, the students and young professionals around the world. So be brave, ask your questions in the chat or ask to be unmuted and speak with us directly. Last, uh, last episode, we had some really good people chime in, unmuted their mics, and that's what we're here for. This is, this is about you guys. What do you need? Ask us. So um, without further ado, it is an honor to introduce our guest this evening, Dr. Babak Enayati. Welcome. Thank you, Ben. I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and read your bio here to get everyone familiar. Dr. Babak Enayati received his PhD in electrical engineering from Clarkson University in 2009. He joined National Grid in the same year and is currently the manager of the new technology team, which is responsible for the implementation of the new technologies to meet National Grid's intel intelligent electric network objective to cl deliver clean and affordable energy to its customers. Since Babak joined National Grid, he has held engineering positions in the protection engineering, retail connections engineering, and new energy solutions departments. Dr. Nyati joined the Inst Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers in 2006 and is currently a senior IEEE member. Currently serves as the Vice President of Education on the IEEE Power and Energy Society Governing Board and he is the current chair of the IEEE PES Transmission Subcommittee. He also serves as the vice chair of the IEEE Standard 1547 Standard for Interconnecting Distributed Energy Resources with Electric Power Systems and the IEEE P 2800 Standard for Interconnection and Interoperability of Inverter Based Resources Interconnecting with Associated Transmission Electric Power Systems. Dr. Niati is a registered professional engineer in the state of Massachusetts. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Clinton, and happy to be here. Yeah, on, on your advice, actually, when we last uh, chatted and, and the team really liked it and thought it was a good idea, we're going to try something new with this episode. Um, we're going to divide up the hour into four sections, focusing each, each section on a, on a specific topic. So the first topic will be grid enhancing technologies and the challenges of integrating distributed energy resources onto the grid. The second topic will be the emerging use of robotics in substation transmission, distribution, maintenance, and inspections and other applications. The third topic will be the push for energy storage technologies at scale. And lastly, we will talk about some practical career advice for students and young professionals and uh, anything that is left that we need to address, we'll get to it at the end. So without further ado, what are grid enhancing technologies for our first topic? Let's, let's kick it off. Sure. Uh, grid enhancing technologies to me is, is a group of technologies that um, or solutions that we deploy in our uh, electric network, both distribution, transmission, and also generation, I should say, uh, that number one allows us to utilize the existing capacity of our network in a more dynamic fashion. Plus, it brings us more capabilities um, with, with regards to con better controlling um, the power flow on the uh, transmission network, distribution network, and so on. So, so I would put this in like two different categories. Um, we do have some, uh, you know, a good percentage of um, capacity on our transmission network and distribution network that we're not currently utilizing. Um, and the reason for that is basically we did not have access to these uh, new solutions like dynamic line rating, dynamic transformer rating, and so on. On the other hand, going beyond the existing um, capacity uh, of the network, we also need um, you know need to bring in new new capabilities to the system. Um, so new capabilities in terms of as they said, 
uh, being able to control the magnitude of the power flow on the network. Um, and uh, all of this, basically, the, the ultimate goal is to uh, be able to transition from the traditional electric network to the futuristic network where we can uh, integrate hundreds of uh, gigawatts of um, offshore wind generation um, and, and solar and, and other types of resources into the grid and at the same time keep the, uh, you know, the customer electric bills affordable. What would be some of the like fundamental baseline components that would be part of this future grid? If you had to break it down into some things we need to do first to establish a foundation for this to build on, what are some, what are the, some of the fundamentals? So, to me, there there are three areas that um, we need to um, you know improve. Uh, number one, the the technology itself, the solutions that that are out there. Some of them are commercialized, some are in the process of being commercialized and, and developed. So uh, uh, that's one aspect, the, the technology, the innovation. Um, the other aspect is the standards. Um, so, of course, with the traditional standards, the old, you know, uh, tariffs and so on, um, we, we cannot, uh, you know, transform the grid to that futuristic vision that we have. Right, so, um, in other words, um, those standards were written based on our existing rules and system operations and policy. Um, so, so the standards need to be um, updated as well. And the third piece that I'm, um, you know, uh, that's very important is the policy. Um, from from policy perspective, there needs we need uh, a big um, revolution. Uh, the way we, uh, you know, our, our current policies um, uh, do not fully support, you know, that futuristic um, grid that we we, we envision in the, for the, you know, for the next um, decade or so. Um, these, like, I'll, I'll, I can talk about that later, you know, when the questions come up. But you know, the the market um, that that is currently in place for energy transactions um, and so on in the distribution network and transmission network. Do not fully support um, the integration of, of distributed energy resources and energy storage on both distribution and transmission system. Um, so, so, so those three pieces are the ones that really need immediate uh, attention uh, to, to enable that futuristic grid. What's been like a really good example of a a great standard that you've seen that's been effective, that's been that's done a really good job of of leading the industry in the right way that we can point to is like this is this is how we should be mod like you know modeling our standards after, and maybe the same for same for policies. If you could give an example of like a good policy that you've seen that has directed things right uh, for standards, I would give IEEE fifteen forty seven as a good example um, when you know. So, I would say, like, say, 10 years ago, when the penetration of distributed energy resource on the grid uh, was low, um, all the, the generators were supposed to just push power to the grid and sell power to the grid and, and uh, basically uh, bring profits to, um, uh, to the developer, to, to the generator owner. Um, so things changed. So, they, as the penetration uh, increased, uh, we, 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 as the utilities, you know, started to see some impact on system power quality and other other issues. And there was a time that uh, we needed better standards so that these generators can participate in, say, voltage regulation, frequency regulation, right through and all other technical, or, or I'm sorry, uh, the support, the grid support functionalities that the generators can provide. Um, so IEEE 1547, uh, in a very timely manner, um, went through a major revision uh, to uh, basically enable uh, these, uh, you know, the, the, the grid support functionalities. And um, the, it was a timely work um, because the, the, the industry really needed that. And so the standard was, the new standard was published in 2018, and now uh, it's going through the certification process by um, nationally recognized testing labs like UL and other, um, uh, other labs. So uh, that will be my example. In terms of policy work, uh, I am seeing that you know uh, some states that are already experiencing 
high penetration of distributed energy resources, um, are pioneering uh, and, uh, in setting up new policies that would support the enhancement of, of uh, distributed energy resource deployments, states like California, um, where um, you know they're 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 seeing high penetration of um, say solar generation, and also they had um, you know great policies to support the deployment of energy storage um, to uh, mitigate some of the adverse impact of these um, you know solar generators um, on on the on the system. Um, in general, I, I do see that uh, there are some. There is some in interest, I should say, at this point to develop markets um, for distributed energy resources. Um, in Europe, um, things are a little bit ahead of the game compared to the rest of the world um, in terms of you know putting place those markets uh, that would um, uh, en enable the energy transaction um, on a on a um, on a daily basis. Right. Okay. What would like? What would kind of um? I mean the manifestation of that look like it, it's far as in North America, what, how do you, would you see that developing that the consumers would have access to a market? Would it just be that they would have a subscription to a, to a utility that's maybe has distributed energy resources all over the country and they pay kind of like a utility to this everywhere or, or is it more localized? And uh, yeah, what do you, what do you think? I, I think the first step to, um, to get to that, um, final uh, vision that we have in terms of, you know, people having many choices. I think the first step um, would be uh, to do that locally, um, but we're, in order to get there, even to implement that market uh, locally, uh, we need to have distribution, distributed system, op distribution system operators as well. So uh, in the US, uh, we have transmission system operators like ISOs, and, and, and utilities, so we call it TSO. But DSO is still a, uh, even though we've been talking about this for a few years, uh, DSO is still a new concept in the US right. and, and North America. Right. Unlike Europe, where we have, we do have DSOs already established in place, and that enables that uh, market transaction where, uh, you know, the distribution connected DERs can participate in the market um, and it's not going to be just state incentives. That's way beyond, um, you know, the incentives that uh, each state provide. Right, right. And then those incentives can be really important because we're we're trying to incentivize the TSOs and the DSOs to why would they even want to to carry this power to where it needs to go and and who's paying who and all these different policies that need to be in place. And That's and again, I really encourage. Um, I think. As we go through each 15 minute section, we've got about 2 minutes left on this 1. It'd be really nice at the end of each 15 minute section. If, if anyone want to chime in with a question from the audience, we are really welcoming them. We encourage them. Please do don't be shy. Um, and, and I guess. Have you seen in national grid is are some of the work that they do? Is that leading towards um, working with TSOs and DSOs to to study this? Yes, absolutely. So, at Na actually, National Grid has been one of the leading um, utilities uh, and, and its grid enhancing technologies, um, uh, you know, deployment of these technologies and making sure that it's we don't just get stuck in a pilot phase. We 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 work with our regulators, with the policymakers, to to demonstrate the benefits of utilizing these technologies, so that we can go beyond just a pilot and. Uh, and deploy this, uh, you know, these solutions in, in a larger scale. And that was actually that's that's you know what my team has been doing at National Grid, uh, deploying these technologies and and working with like FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and state PUCs uh, to make sure that they're you know we we, uh, uh, we we develop we create new policies that would uh, you know um, uh, facilitate the deployment of the technologies. Wonderful. Um... Is that also does that tie into the next topic of robotics? Is National Grid part of the part of the push for emerging uh, robotics kind of applications in in transmission and distribution maintenance and and kind of diagnosing problems? And you have mentioned it when we chatted that you'd like to, and I actually didn't know that robotics were uh, a, an important part of this. So please educate me, educate us. Absolutely. Um... So yes, robotics is uh, uh, is is something that we've been uh, you know is, is 
the, the concept that the solution is still new for us. So we've been investigating in that to see, you know, uh, if robotics can, can really help us. Um, and this goes back to, like, say, like four or five years ago. Uh, and we did find some uh, pretty interesting use cases that we thought uh, robotics can, can really uh, assist, um, you know, uh, the utility companies. Um, and I would say, you know, let's start with um, some of our traditional practices um, in terms of substation maintenance, for example. So we would have uh, frequent uh, maintenance schedule um, and we'll have, you know, crews walking, um, you know, in, in the uh, substation and taking some photos uh, from some asset, like doing some actual visual inspection um, and uh, and then analyzing those images, right? Um, the, uh, on the other hand, there are like some areas at some of our substations that we cannot walk in uh, during operations. So, like, say, our HVDC substations, right? Um, there are some rooms within those substations that, that we call them tire store valve halls. That's the area that all the switching is done, you know, like DC to AC inverter um, uh, switching. And because of that switching noise and in, in all the EMF uh, in, the, in that room, it's not um, <clears throat> basically uh, human cannot walk in while the system is live because of, you know, the health impact. So wow, like that's just purely like uh, electromagnetic radiation. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So so yeah, it can be say cancerous and and you know not not good for for us to walk in uh, while the system is live, and so what we did uh, we worked with this company. I'm sure you've heard the name Boston Dynamics uh, to to see if they can develop some robots that uh, can walk into you know uh, to these. Places, you know, the, the, the tire store valve hall and some other areas that uh, may be difficult for us to, to inspect on a daily basis or a weekly basis. Um, and that out of from this collaboration, we actually uh, developed a robot um, uh, that has all the payloads on it, all different cameras that we need uh, for a typical inspection. So this robot um, is now uh, it's been adopted by, by National Grid. It's in daily operations at one of our stations now, um, and uh, we are, we actually have um, two others in, in other locations in New York as well. But this specific example, so you go to the substation, you would see a robot, uh, like a four-legged robot, uh, the spot robot. I'm not sure if you've seen the photos. Yeah, of that. yeah, yeah. Yeah, like a little dog-shaped uh, robot, and you you you'll see the robot walking at the, the in the yard, you know, the substation. Uh, and taking some pictures, everything is autonomous. Um, you don't need anyone to actually keep watching the robot. Uh, right. We actually program it to walk in specific uh, areas within the station. Uh, that includes the, you know, the, the tire store valve hall, um, and so you know, or the backyard, uh, you know, where where we have the uh, the transformers. So we'd walk in, take some photos, uh, and all those photos get. Uh, uh, basically submitted to, um, you know, to an operator. So this operator will take a look and, and see if, if, if there's anything wrong with that or not. And um, the other thing I want to mention uh, about this uh, robotic solution is um, we're actually going beyond that by automating the um, process of analyzing those images that robots take. Um, oh, wow. So we call that image analytics. Uh, and we've been uh, collaborating with uh, with some companies uh, that are pioneering in that field, they've developed software that you can basically uh, feed in uh, hundreds, thousands of uh, images, and uh, this software will basically look for anomalies and some defects uh, within the substation um, and would raise those issues. Um, and this is not just for for the for the photos or images that robots take. Uh, we have like other programs like drones, uh, like helicopters. We we ride helicopters above our transmission lines and towers. Take some photos there from from those assets as well. Um, so all that gets uh, fed into this software, um, which would basically you know uh, you would, you wouldn't need human resources to analyze every single image. Um, right. So in the future, I do see um, you know. Um, a great potential 
for for robotics in the utility business. Yeah. Uh, the other example I would give uh, in terms of robotics application is uh, something that we, uh, the, the robot that we developed basically uh, in collaboration with um, the company called Kinetrix. Uh, this company developed a robot that, that we can um, basically put on the transmission line and this robot crawls all over the line span and it gives us the corrosion information of that line. Um, the, our, our past practices uh, have been focused on basically just cutting the line, a piece of the line, sending it to the lab, and, and you may wait for a month or two uh, for this test to be done, and then you would see the test results only apply to that cut section of the, uh, of the line. But with this robot, I don't even need to take an outage. I don't need to cut the line. I just put wow. the robot on the line while it's live, um, and it would give me information, you know, within minutes. So uh, we're, we're saving a lot of time, like staff hours um, and, and the expenses uh, in the future. It'd be amazing if they could someday develop it so that they could uh, traverse the tower as well to get to the next section of line. That would be exactly ideal. more like you know, I do see that's coming actually, you know, maybe like having more like drone capability as well and some uh, artificial intelligence where. You, it spans the line and then flies over to the next span uh, wow. and starts scanning it again. Wow. So as someone who's only been pretty much in school, I've, I've only got to see uh, substations from outside the fence peering in. Um, I'm really surprised that there's this much visual inspection that it's such an aspect because in my mind, I was thinking all of the sensors and data that everyone was talking about and all the things that are coming in are always just like what harmonically is happening, what is happening to the signals, the voltage current and all the frequency regulation, all that, but I didn't realize. So it's really important to have like high resolution visual inspections of things. What are you looking for? Like, for example, when you go into that, that room that you're talking about, what exactly would you see that would be an anomaly that you could visually see? So normally like, uh, uh, you know, some, some, like say like cooling systems may leak um, or uh, you know, there are some alarms, um, you know, or uh, maybe, you know, something is burning and like making a little bit of smoke that we can't, we won't notice because nobody is in. Of course, like there are some smoke detectors there, but uh, if it's something that, you know, you it's so that the early phases of developing right, right. Like a bigger issue, uh, so those can be, uh, it can be caught uh, before it becomes a serious problem. Um, so, um, so yeah, and, and really anything can happen. Um, uh, you know, in, in that uh, within that room, or even externally, uh, sometimes um, you know you you basically inspect a, uh, just a, like oil spill of, of the transformer. That um, uh, you know, we if if it's not say like we do, I don't know, maybe like monthly inspection, right? So within that month, there you know some issues may happen that you may not catch if you don't use the straw bot for that daily inspection. Right, right. And with machine learning and AI, it can be really, really effective at spotting a difference between, you know, like what's different in this picture. It's like, oh, there's a pool of, <laughs> of fluid beneath this transformer. Like, that's that's really cool. Um, so do you see this as also an alleviation of labor shortage as well? In all reality, it's an economic interest of some of these utilities to implement this technology. Um, don't have enough workers to inspect lines. Well, it's not just the um, the actual worker. I, I mean, there's we're using ro robotic solutions for the type of job that can be done by the robot, so that we can allocate those resources to some other task that really requires human, you know, um, uh, analysis and human uh, basically uh, work. Right. So. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say that, you know, it's not about lack of resources, it's more like um, optimizing and, and making our grid operations and field um, field work, uh, maintenance work more efficient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. Um, and, and so National Grid has had a history of investing in new technologies, emerging things, um, you also, you also had a different position. I don't think I mentioned it in the bio but that was, um, about researching, um, like potential prototyping things, uh, uh, 
I, I can't remember it, but uh, you could elaborate on that position a little bit that you had in the past. Um, yeah, so the title was research development and demonstration uh, engineer. Right. right. Um, uh, uh, so yes, uh, for for a period of time, I worked um, at National Grid with, with researching new solutions um, uh, for uh, some of our grid issues, and um, it's kind of like uh, kind of like related to the work that I'm, my team is doing right now. Um, and um, in that phase, uh, we actually we we we, we were collaborating with. Uh, like IEEE with EFRI and some other research organizations to kind of shape our future uh, to have a better perspective on uh, you know how do we how do we um, transition from where we are to uh, to be the uh, one of the leading transmission um, and distribution system owners and operators right so so my role there was to do that research uh, and. Um, Potentially pilot some uh, uh, some some new technologies uh, that that national grid uh, could see benefit in, and then um, assist with you know with that transition. Uh, and then later on, once we had formed basically my team, that was the, our our main focus to bring in as you know more new technologies to the grid and pilot them and and, and scale them up. So it seems like national grid really kind of sits in the middle between. Private and academic kind of research world of of it's bringing it to utilities, but it's also has some sort. It doesn't seem like it's always necessarily about capitalist private industries making making money, making profit. So um, that's an interesting position to be in. So does that affect how you design things? Does it affect your budget constraints and and other considerations when you're kind of in the middle there? It, it kind of does. Um, um, this goes back to my um, point on um, on you know policy support. So when we're uh, when we deploy these new technologies, um, where one of the biggest benefits is basically to defer capital investment, right? Um, and the traditional utility business model has been well, we uh, you know, we make money out of capital investment. There's like that return that comes to the utility uh, from that capital investment. Uh, so, so once you defer that, um, basically, it's kind of like against our traditional approach. Um, however, because National Grid sees the value uh, in, um, you know, delivering the, the the energy to our customers in a in a very affordable way. Uh, we've always shown interest in technologies that would uh, keep our customer bills um, uh, affordable, um, which means basically, you know, yes, we are deferring capital investment. However, um, you know, this basically, you know, this this solution is going to, uh, uh, you know, defer uh, that big investment that that we could have had without that solution. Uh, right. On the right. other hand, uh, when I talk about policy. Um, you know, we have, we have requested, we have, we have asked, you know, our policymakers like like FERC and state PUCs to always uh, consider uh, some sort of incentives for utilities that are really deploying these uh, solutions to defer capital investment. Right. That's a really interesting. Uh, that's a really interesting job all around. That's really cool. Um, what we have, we actually have a question now from uh, Rogahe. Abdullahi, um, he says, or they say, what will be the major issues in future grid and how will it be different from the current ones? Wow, that's a, that's a big question. <laughs> so major issues in the future grid. Um, we are uh, basically, you know, when we talk about distributed energy resources, one of the biggest concerns that um, uh, right now uh, we're we're, we think we're going to face, and not just think, we're pretty sure we're going to face, uh, is losing grid inertia. Um, in the in the old days where we had uh, those, you know, large uh, generators, uh, rotating mass connected to the transmission network, they would provide frequency support. Um, you know, there, there's enough grid inertia. Uh, now that we're replacing those um, uh, wholesale generation, um, which, you know, with um, clean uh, uh, renewable distributed energy resources or maybe even transmission level uh, connected, uh, um, you know, clean generation, 
uh, which most of them are inverter-based solutions. So that impacts the uh, grid inertia. Um, inertia meaning that basically decreases that inertia. Uh, so that means, you know, if we just continue to do this without any major solutions, like grid forming inverters and so on, um, we're going to see um, issues like, you know, we tip one a portion of the grid goes out of service due to a fault, and that can cause some instability issues in the future. So we need to be very vigilant and, and, and really careful uh, to make sure that, you know, we are moving in the right direction, but we have to make sure that, you know, the grid still uh, remains stable. So I would say, uh, you know, inertia is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, the, uh, the other um, uh, challenge that I would uh, mention is system protection. System protection, um, you know, most of the relays that are out there, they're, they're based on overcurrent protection. I know we have other types of relays as well in transmission network. Uh, but the distribution system network has um, been mainly protected by, uh, by, by overcurrent relays. And uh, the inverter-based resources have very limited uh, fault current uh, capability. Mm -hmm. um, and and as, as, as the fault current level in the grid decreases as you add more inverter-based resources, uh, then it, it, it can become problematic uh, for these relays to actually detect faults and, and isolate the fault from the rest of the grid. So we're moving towards solutions like adaptive relaying where relays, um, you know, the settings of the relays can be remotely changed uh, by a smart, um, I would say, brain uh, uh, that would basically look at the available fault current and then send command signals to relays to, to pick the right right setting. Um, so, so protection would be the, uh, the, the second um, challenge. Uh, the other thing is uh, the I, I would highlight the importance of, um, you know, how we look at the grid, um, now, you know, and say like 20 years from now, we're going to have many third party owned distributed energy resources um, and utilities will basically maintain power. Um, however, the maintenance of these resources, make sure they're available um, is also another challenge for, um, you know, for the utilities. Uh, if it's third party owned, uh, you need to make sure that you have the right um, rules in place for maintenance. And last but not least, um, uh, I always uh, highlight this. We, we are continuously seeing increased number of cyber issues on our electric network. Um, right. and, and I do see this becoming uh, a, a bigger challenge in the next 20 to 30 years because uh, we keep adding you know, um, say, uh, foreign uh, manufactured devices um, on, on our grid, uh, which basically kind of opens up the grid for more, uh, more like cyber attacks. So <clears throat> um, I, I would say, you know, the standards need to be updated for cyber um, and our IT uh, infrastructure needs to be uh, hardened. Uh, uh, to make sure that these cyber attacks that again increasing um, continuously uh, do not uh, create any any major issues um, and so you always have there's always a risk for that cyber right you can't have like hundred percent secure system um, with that being said you need to have uh, kind of like backup um, plan as well so if you do lose power you got to make sure you do have enough microgrids enough local resources in place to make sure that the critical loads, um, you know, do not lose power during the cyber attack. So some, something like, you know, what Army has been doing for many years. That's really interesting because a lot of the things that you just listed with, with um, replacing or synthesizing inertia, protection considerations, um, a lot of those things, it's, it seems like they do depend on an, a lot more communication than was ever there before and a lot more interconnectedness and a lot more two way sensors and uh, that that was ever there before. So it's interesting that as we need these things, we are adding more and more risk of cybersecurity threats on top of it. So it's, um, it's a very, it's a sticky problem. Yes, absolutely. We have another question uh, in the chat here from uh, Puya Zolfi. Where are we in terms of replacing conventional grid interfacing converters with new efficient semiconductor technologies, such as gallium nitride and silicon carbide? Is that right? No, I don't know. <laughs> I know the gallium nitride one, SIC. So, 
I think in the next, uh, well, that's, this is one of the, one of the hot topics, um, at, at this point, um, the, we're not going to retrofit. I, I, well, at least I, okay, I, say, I don't think we're going to retrofit the existing devices with, with, uh, with these new solutions. However, I, I, you know, the short answer is, um, I do see that in the next 5 years, that transition is going to happen. And a second question um, they ask as well is national grid participating in any fault current limiter technology development. If yes, what are the major design challenges? Um, so, fault current limiter, yes, um, uh, 1 thing that, that we always need to make sure we keep in mind is that. <clears throat> excuse me, um, the. We always have, um, you know, safety on top of basically everything, um, you know, uh, when it comes to, um, you know, making sure our crews are, are safe at the substations and so on. Um, so, our flash studies are, are always being done by the utilities, make sure, you know, the crews that are very close to, um, to the switching devices and the, and the device opens, you know, there's arc energy there and, and it doesn't create any sort of like hazardous conditions to the to the staff, um, so they have like the right PPE clothing and um, um, uh, and so on. And um, so, yes, in some areas where we think that the arc flash energy is high uh, for uh, for that uh, distance that our our crews can get close to those switching devices, uh, and we do not have any other way of reducing that arc flash energy, um, then we would reduce the, the magnitude of the fault current. By utilizing some fault current limiting um, device, like reactors and so on. So the answer is yes, but it's like more like on a on a case by case basis. Right, right, absolutely. Um, and we have to move on to our 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 last technical topic, which is energy storage. I I was so excited when you suggested this topic because this is something I'm super passionate about. I feel like it's the missing keystone in a lot of this. Um, uh, Optimistic future about the grid. Um, how? What have you been seeing as far as energy storage? What is the most likely route we're going to go? What kind of combinations of energy storage technologies are are we about to see on the horizon? Yeah, um, with energy storage, one of the one of the good things that I'm, I'm seeing uh, is that policymakers are really taking this seriously. They have come up with some good policies. To support the deployment of energy storage, I do see an even a state level and FERC level. So that's that's the positive side. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, energy storage is not just all about you know putting a battery at home um, and and when the when the power is down, you keep your TV on so that you can watch football. Right. Um, it is, um, so you know from grid perspective, uh, things are a lot more complicated. And we have different types of energy storage. So, for example, uh, I mean, and of course, depending on the need of the grid, sometimes we have, like, say, a, a frequency disturbance, uh, and and uh, you need a fast response uh, from an energy storage device, but you don't need like a longer duration. You want something that can push power in a very short period of time, just to help get help the grid, uh, you know, resolve that frequency disturbance. So, like flywheels can can basically be a good good option for that sort of energy support. Like they're not going to last for a long time. I'm not talking about like hours of flywheels operation. Right. However, um, when it comes to like more like uh, grid re re uh, resiliency issues, where you have like an outage or due to a fault uh, or like a cyber attack or anything like that, then you would go transition from more like fast response, short duration energy storage to uh, a longer duration energy storage, so like more like batteries that can uh, provide that sort of solution. Um, and um, beyond that, actually, uh, we are seeing the energy storage uh, not only can also provide you know resiliency uh, uh, benefits, frequency regulation benefits, and, and uh, other other benefits that we won't have time to cover all of them, but more like they, they can also support good reliability as well. Uh, and um, I can actually give you a, a, a real example that we uh, finished, you know, we completed at National Grid. Um, there's an island in the state of Massachusetts called Nantucket. 
And uh, if you go there for a vacation, that's a, they have like great beaches and it's a really beautiful island only in the summertime. And yeah. uh, so what happens is uh, during the summer peak, like I would say maybe July and August for two months, uh, the peak, um, the load is at its peak. Um, and uh, there are two undersea cables actually, um, you know, feeding this island. If one one feeder fails for any reason, the other feeder cannot uh, support right. that peak load during two summer months. So the island is going to lose power because of losing one feeder. So, so we looked at that that um, potential issue that was coming up soon, and uh, so we had many, many options. We were like, well, the first option is actually build the third cable, right? Sure, you add sure. another under the undersea cable just to make sure if one fails, the other two can still keep the lights on in the, in the island. That was not um, like a cost-effective solution. Um, the other solution that, that we considered was actually put some battery storage um, in the island. So during the time that we, that, you know, we lose one feeder um, and we have high peak, high load uh, in that island, the battery storage can take that, you know, can turn on and, and take that uh, excess power um, you know, provide that excess power that, that the island needs uh, until, um, you know, the, uh, the feeder comes back online. So, so that way we, we were able to defer building that third cable until 2045. So that's a great reliability example that I can give. Yeah. My one concern about like the, the battery storage technology is that um, like you said, it's, it's, Long term in the in re relative to a say a flywheel, um, but it's relatively short term. Like it can only store its capacity for within a year. Is that correct? Like give or take, like it degrades after a few months. You lose tiny amounts of capacity as you go on. Like well, that that is correct. I I yeah. I don't want to give you that one year as a time timeline. Um, it's more like depending. It depends on the number of. Um, full cycles that the, that the battery goes through. So right. of course it goes through like more frequent cycles. Of course, that that degradation is going to be faster. Totally. And, and it just seems like there hasn't been enough industry appetite for recycling lithium ion batteries. And from a holistic perspective, zooming out large scale lithium ion batteries um, seem like Kind of a short term solution to me is that is uh, that's just my feeling and I just wondering like how you feel about I really feel like um, engineering materials and material science has so much work to do on battery chemistry that would actually be a game changer because right now lithium ion batteries seem like oh like 10 years and you're down you're down 20 25% depending on how many cycles um, you go as far as capacity, which is not great. Totally agree uh, battery lithium ion. Uh, and, and energy storage in, in general, uh, you know, more like batteries, um, do need uh, still some more work, on, uh, you know, in terms of the technology itself and, and the chemistry. Um, uh, we, we, you know, lithium ion, of course, it has, uh, it has its own decommissioning uh, issues, you know, as, as you mentioned. Um, so, yes, as we're deploying more, uh, more energy storage, projects, um, the cost is going down. I can, I can see that. Right. Uh, however, um, we still need more like technology enhancement, like fire protection, like, uh, some, some other challenges that these batteries, um, actually do, uh, cause uh, that need to be resolved. Um, I would love to see, you know, right now, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, the, the standard, um, duration that we have for for um, a typical grid scale um, and a battery, lithium ion battery, more like the, you know, the, the, the higher end is like four hours. Um, and then, um, but that's not enough. So like, you know, we need to invest in solutions that would have, you know, provide more like longer duration um, for, for grid scale um, batteries. And uh, even though, you know, keeping the cost down, I, I, I fully agree with you that, you know, the other issues need to be uh, addressed. And um, I, I am 
seeing that, you know, uh, more likely, you know, lead acid batteries and, and other batteries are actually getting more attention and, and, the, and the utility business. However, still lithium ion is, is the, uh, you know, the dominant, I should say, a battery solution. Yes. Totally, totally. I mean, there's so many good, good technologies out there. Uh, flow batteries as well have some really interesting advantages and like, depending on where you are, pumped hydro can be an incredibly tried and trusted and robust solution. Um, I'm so into it. I really think, I hope, I hope more people look into that part of the system because it seems like it's, a, it's an area that's lacking. We've got some more questions as well. Um, I don't know if we, I'll ask you what you think we should do. We could, we could answer um, a few more questions and they probably will keep us going. And then maybe we'll only have a tiny brief moment to go over career advice, or we could just get right into the career advice, whatever you want to talk about. It's totally up to you. I can take questions and yeah, maybe why, why don't we just take maybe a couple of questions and then we'll have 10 minutes for what a career sure. advice. Yeah. Sounds good. So we've got a question here from uh, probably Conrad. It looks like it says, what is your opinion about microgrids formation? Do you think this will be something feasible and used in future distribution systems? Yeah, microgrids, um, uh, there, I do see uh, more like two challenges for microgrids. Number one is, is cost. Um, microgrids uh, require, um, I would say most of them, when, you, when I talk about microgrids, I'm talking about like a town level microgrids. I'm not talking about like a behind a meter residential load or a commercial load. That's a different story. So larger scale microgrids uh, require a communication infrastructure in place uh, because the microgrid controller needs to be able to control the critical load and and also the the available resources. Um, so so that's one of the um, one of the factors that need to be considered in the micro in the future uh, design of microgrids. Uh, well, I say again, like, that's one of the challenges. Um, um, the other piece of you know or, or the challenge that I I do see uh, for for microgrids in the future is uh, the lack of like solid policies um, mm -hmm. so, uh, who's paying who when the utility is gone you know right so that's um you may have like you know 10 20 different available resources they're all on um, and some critical loads like you know shelter police station uh, and others um who, who are you know when the rest of the grid is gone um who are you charging right so what are that that Financial transactions and agreements that need to be in place. Um, I'm, I'm, I still don't see a lot of um, great uh, enhancements and improvements in that area. Right. This is really interesting. Almost every single podcast episode we've had, there's at some point we eventually get to policies and policy making. And it's so interesting before I ever got into this, studying this and into this power and energy world. It seems so much like an engineering straightforward thing, but so much of it seems like political and human idea. It's a problem with communicating ideas and convincing minds. If if there's someone if someone in the audience out there is looking to be effective in policy making, where can, how can they like um, refine their craft? How can they become a, an effective person who changes minds or ch makes policies happen? Yeah, uh, well, I don't want to blame just the policymakers for uh, because you know issues like this uh, are very complicated, uh, yeah. and um, so I want to you know make sure that we all understand that you know when you're designing microgrids, coming up with the right uh, and, uh, policies uh, for different rates under different conditions, it, it's not it's not simple. However, it's possible. So. Um, uh, one of the one of the challenges that I, I, I do see um, that need to be addressed in the near future um, uh, is the gap between uh, engineering and policy. Um, at this point, um, I, in some parts of the country, I do see that that gap is even bigger, uh, right. meaning that you know engineers are not fully aware of what's happening on the policy side, and the policymakers do not have enough. Um, engineering information to come up with the right policies. So it's, it's, sometimes we do see some policies come out that uh, 
uh, you know, uh, do not fully align with engineering practices. So I think uh, in order to come up with, with the right policies, um, we need to fill that gap. Um, we need to educate our policymakers on the technical side as well so that they can develop the right policies. Yeah, and that also sounds like an opportunity for education, maybe for universities to take the lead and give engineers some some policy background. Because as far as um, my peers and my colleagues at BCIT, we have a really holistic system, but that's something we haven't really touched much yet is we've touched economics, we've touched standards, but we haven't really looked at policies and maybe that's a gap that universities could also help fill on the engineering side. Absolutely. That's, yeah. that's a great idea. And I, from PS, as the PSVP of education, I would fully support it. And if universities need, aid, need my help uh, and resources uh, to come up with some joint programs, I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And we have uh, one last question from uh, Havanchandra Mandava. What is your opinion on vehicle to grid? Um, that's 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 coming soon. Um, you know, so I, I do see some states have already implemented this V2G, uh, like California, uh, and you know, I'm sure in in Europe as well. That's been a, you know probably a common practice now in some countries. Um, it, it, and I do see that, you know, and say, like, maybe 10, 20 years from now, um, we will have this in most parts of the world, um, or like, maybe like developed countries, uh, the, it, it does, it, you know, uh, create its own challenges, uh, especially from grid planning perspective, grid operations. Um, you know, when, when we talk about distribution planning, transmission planning, um, we, uh, we always need to consider. Uh, you know, these additional batteries and resources uh, that push power back to the grid. So that makes things um, um, a little bit complicated. And uh, as we add, as we're adding more like incentives to this, uh, we, I, I do see that, you know, this is going to become a, a more challenging issue. However, um, there is a reason for that. Um, we, we can actually utilize this uh, V2G. Uh, for some uh, peak shaving, for example, you know, this is something that I think Dominion is doing uh, with, with their school bus program uh, that these school buses, uh, uh, you know, they, they basically, uh, you know, they're, they're charged, they discharge back to the grid during uh, grid peak um, load. And, and that way uh, they actually bring the, um, you know, the load down and, and you know, they shave the peak so that they can, uh, the, you know, we can defer again, upgrading those distribution feeders. Um, and, and those are the benefits that are going to be, you know, becoming more and more common uh, in the near future. That's a brilliant example because that those buses are quite predictable of when they will be back and ready to supply the power at certain hours. And it's usually not within peak hours anyway. So that's, that's great. Um, just in the last 7 minutes here, we'd love to get your opinion on. What, what can, what makes new and emerging potential employees, people looking for their first job, um, what would you be doing right now in this era to be sharpening your skills and making yourself a really uh, um, appealing prospect for a company? Number one, um, try to have as many internship programs as you can. Try to join those programs. The culture between you know, the, the, the industry culture is uh, totally different than what you would experience at a university. Uh, so joining these internship opportunities, these programs, really gives you that sense of how, how does it feel to work for, for industry? Um, and, and based on, the, and, and when, the, you know, the, the leaders in the industry, they, they look at your resume, uh, when they see that, oh, yeah, you've had like one or two internship programs and they look at the outcome that, you know, uh, what was the outcome of that program? Uh, this gives them the indication that you are uh, kind of like semi familiar with the culture uh, of industry, uh, which again, as I said, can be totally different than what you would experience at the school. So that's that that would be my uh, number 1 recommendation. Uh, number 2 um, is networking. Um, that has been, that has helped me, me myself a lot, um, you know, and, and I'm sure it's going to help you as well. When you do network, when you talk to the right people, 
uh, at like various conferences, it really sharpens your mind. You, 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 you seek advice uh, from people in different um, energy sectors, different, different industry sectors. And that's how you basically, uh, you know, think about, so how does it look like, uh, you know, to work for, uh, for an EV manufacturer or like a utility or, you know, uh, like a FERC or policymakers in general. Um, so, so networking is, is a great example and to, in the, uh, or, or, or is my, basically my recommended approach uh, to get all that knowledge. Um, where do you do this networking? By attending conferences, or if you cannot go to these big conferences, go to your local events and, um, and uh, always don't be shy to ask, ask questions uh, and ask for advice. And on the, on the academic side, uh, if you, if you were back in school today and you were focusing on something, let's say at the, at the graduate level, um, or, or just, or you just, you were doing some professional development, where do you think people could really be using their time wisely to improve themselves in what specific fields? So, like, you're, you're saying, like, you know, in what areas in within power system is that? Is that yeah, point? yeah, absolutely. If if you could really study something and get specialized, where 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 do we need more specialists? So um, the areas that I mentioned um, in terms of grid protection is being one of the biggest challenges. Uh, right now, industry needs more and more, uh, you know, protection engineers. It's not an easy field. Uh, I'm not saying the other ones are easy, but protection can <laughs> be pretty complicated. Uh, right. I did protection for a few years at National Grid, and I really enjoyed it. Um, so, taking some power system protection courses uh, would basically shine in your resume, you know, when you when you're applying for jobs, um, and also planning, uh, system planning, uh, both transmission and distribution. Um, uh, these are the two areas that I would uh, mention, you know, that that you would need, um, you know, that would really increase the chance of uh, employment. Um, and I don't want to uh, be I do also want to highlight um, the importance of system operations. Um, I don't think there are any sort of like dedicated courses on system operations. Uh, however, um, you know, during your, your internship programs uh, with some of the system operation uh, platform developers like ABB uh, and others, um, you should be able to gain that knowledge on how uh, system switching and operations work, uh, which would again help with the, with the employment process. So much there, so much, so much in each section. Um, I really, I really appreciate this new format. I think we're gonna go with it. We all, I liked it. It really kept my brain firing. Uh, you said so many things that I'm gonna have to rewatch this podcast again and kind of see what, see what's going on. I, I really appreciate your time. And um, if anyone wants to connect with you, I know you're on vacation, but uh, maybe uh, we will be posting, following up uh, the post on our LinkedIn page and tagging you there. So if anyone wants to carry on the conversation, they can. Um, and just thank you so much for your time and your expertise and uh, please enjoy your vacation. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Clint, and it was uh, great to be with you and, and folks on this, um, on this podcast. And I hope that this kind of triggered more thinking, um, uh, you know, uh, it was, it was, uh, you know, worth the time, but, uh, as you said, yes, I'll be uh, available on, on LinkedIn. And if you do have any questions, please post them there. Um, and I'll, you know. I'll answer every single question. Oh, that's great. You're generous. Thank you, sir. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Great turnout. Please come back next month. Priya Mana will be open, um, interviewing our next guest and uh, we'll keep that on a cliffhanger. So thank you so much, everyone. And have a great night. Good night. Good night.